This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, well-recognized writer on the web who is the publisher of the website of two minds.com and certainly no stranger to uh, macro analytics welcome Charles thank you Gordon glad to be here month goes by so quickly and every time we get together there's so much to talk about true I strongly recommend you go to Charles's site uh, of two minds he publishes one article at least every day right Charles one a day Yes. This month, there was two articles, one on the United States and one on China that I really thought merited us spending some time on and having a discussion. So I saw this chart here from Oxfam showing the shift that's happened in the United States. In your article, The Golden Era and the End of Low-Lying Fruit, I thought this really brought it out. What we're seeing is the golden era in the United States of family income and how evenly it was spread. And that we had a very strong middle class and e even on the bottom end could support a family on a single income. And when we look at this new era to see not only has it changed, but the degree that it has changed is just dramatic. It's, does it hit you as hard as it hits me? Definitely, uh, Gordon. And I think that this chart you've selected shows that we really have two eras, and they're very distinctly different. There, there's not a lot of, um, uh, there's similarities, but if you look at the income and, and whether the, the rising tide was raising all ships or only a few yachts, and we can see that there's a, a, a distinct break around 1979-1980 when financialization started. And so uh, the focus of my piece was that this golden era that, that um, a lot of people are nostalgic for and, uh, you know, a lot of, of financial pundits say, why can't we get back to the high growth um, rising tide raises all ships of the 50s and 60s? And um, what they don't understand is we've picked all the low hanging fruit um, that enabled that rapid growth and um, that broad distribution of, of, of prosperity. And um, what's, what's interesting about our talk today is that despite the great differences in uh, economies of the U.S. and China, we, uh, we see the parallel in that the low-hanging fruit in China has already been picked as well. And so even though the, the problems are somewhat different, the, the, um, the context of the stagnation within China and the U.S., there is a similarity. The low-hanging fruit's gone, the conditions for rapid growth are gone, and no one has any plan B. You know, you've been writing, oh, for a couple of years now about this whole financialization model, the damage that it's been doing, consequences of it. In this golden age of the of the 50s and the 60s in, in, in America, do you, do you want to articulate what, what you saw then that, that was so powerful? There were several conditions that were unique to the, the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. And um, one of them was things were very inexpensive. And that may be partly because there was a great abundance of oil. Uh, the U.S. was um, the Saudi Arabia of the 40s and 50s. Um, also, the um, because of the, the Great Depression and the uh, uh, rationing during World War II, that in inflation was... Uh, basically non-existent, but there was a huge pent-up demand for consumer items uh, as a result of people scrimping and saving during 15 years of depression and the uh, war rationing years. And um, the the stimulus that World War II provided was, uh, of course, unprecedented, that the federal government basically printed money and hired tens of millions of people. I mean, 12 million people were in the military alone and millions more were hired in the defense industry. So all these people were now had income and there was nothing to spend their money on because of rationing. 
uh, that all the industrial production of the United States was devoted to uh, global war. So when the war ended, we had um, this huge pool of, of forced savings, if you will, and a huge pent up demand for consumption. And um, at that time, all of our allies um, and enemies had both been leveled. Uh, you know, Germany had been largely destroyed. Japan's industrial production had been destroyed. And our allies, such as France and, and uh, England, had been bled dry by uh, the, the war. And so we were sort of on the top of the world, uh, the largest intact production, um, a huge pool of capital. And sort of by default, the U.S. dollar had been um, chosen by the world as the default uh, reserve currency. We were the biggest trader in the world. Everybody had weak currencies because they had no trade, depressed economies. And we were a massive exporter, exactly as China. So therefore, to buy the goods, the only way they were going to transact was in U.S. dollars. And by default, the U.S. dollar became the reserve currency never mind establishing it at, at, at Bretton Woods. But this prosperity and the rest of the world so depressed that it was inevitable. And as you pointed out, Charles, the Marshall Plan brought money to, and started the, the development, in, in, in uh, at least in Europe, to get the money flowing the, that the Marshall Plan did. We have to be exporting cash. And we were. And this is your whole concept that you've talked about a number of times of the Triffin Paradox, right? That's right. The other element of trade that you and I have discussed is uh, labor arbitrage is the sort of technical term for um, what services and um, goods can be traded. And um, so, of course, if, if, uh, if labor can be traded across borders, uh, then, you know, the domestic workers in the U.S., which used to only compete against other workers in the U.S., now they're competing against an entire global economy of workers. And because all these other nations had extremely weak currencies, then uh, Japanese goods were extremely cheap in the 60s. And, and so, were, um, so were German autos and, and, and everything from Europe because those uh, currencies were very weak compared to the, the dollar. So it was, uh, it was sort of a natural change to start importing all this um, cheap stuff. And also, as you pointed out, energy was very cheap at the time, too. Yeah, incredibly cheap compared. I mean, uh, it took a couple dollars a barrel, basically. Uh, and so there was a there was a basis for prosperity that um, was an anomaly. That's what I think I want to focus our attention on. Is it, it is now we think that we should always have those conditions that there's some sort of default conditions, but they were actually extremely unique to a particular time. And as the um, as our allies rebuilt their economies, those. Uh, conditions changed, and um, and then as a result, uh, we turned to financialization to prop up our prosperity. But that's a, a pact with the devil. We had assumptions that weren't sustainable. They became so baked in because of this low-lying fruit, because of this situation that we'd been blessed with and with hard work. But things started to change. We're going to talk about some of these unsustainable assumptions that are also happening in China for little different reasons. And I'm showing this household sector net worth, and, and you can see how dramatically it has grown since the what I'll call the golden era. Net worth, which is making us feel quite wealthy. And uh, matter of fact, Charles, I don't think most people realize it's, it's up dramatically since the crisis, $25 trillion from the post-crisis low at, at $81 trillion. So even with the, you know, the 2008 crisis, we've recovered on paper quite well um, that because housing is sort of back up it's not maybe at some of the in some cases it's higher than it was before but certainly back up markets are at record highs again so from a net worth we've um, um, we've increased but what hasn't changed and this blue is showing the household net worth is this real disposable income is only growing linearly where the household net worth is growing exponentially and, and, and that's the whole concept of financialization is allowing these assumptions to continue sort of disguised. We're not an exporter anymore. We're a net importer. And therefore we're consuming more than we produce. And we, how we're sustaining it is in this chart, but eventually you run out of runway. And, uh, you know, when you do the division of the two, as shown here, you can see a very clear, and you're a technician, Charles, I know, uh, that looks like a head and shoulders to me, doesn't it? Very much so. 
And I think that's the real chart here that shows what we all know, the difference between Wall Street and Main Street. And we keep people keep saying and saying, you know, they're so different. What's going on in Main Street? And we feel like we're in a recession, but Wall Street, all these numbers are up, but it's unsustainable. And this is really showing the difference and why it's unsustainable. Asset prices may be up, but if the disposable income is not there, you can't afford it. You can't afford that housing. And that's why these peaks happen. So housing's up, but Who's got the money, the jobs, the disposable income? Market's up, but so what? I don't have the money. And you can really see it, Charles, when you look at margins. It's through the roof, but real wealth that's supporting it's also through the floor. So more speculation to a, a bigger degree than we've ever seen. It's got us to a point where we're, we're advancing it with asset appreciation, and I believe we're going to have collateral impairment from non-performing loans, which will soon prick this bubble. But China is at a different point. And China hasn't seen the global arbitrage that we saw here in the United States, that, that which forced everything offshore. But China's now seeing it. Labor rates up, housing prices um, and investments have splurged. So all of a sudden, businesses are starting to withdraw from China. In, to not to a large degree, but, they're, but the capital investment has dramatically slowed. And China is an export economy, but it's investment-driven. We're consumption-driven. They're investment driven, and that's where their big uh, distortion uh, is. And you can see it here, Charles, uh, United States at 71% and China only at 35% on consumption. Um, but look at it in, in fixed capital uh, formation. China's right off the, off the chart, and that's falling off. And it's been the foundation for this dramatic surge in credit which is just ours pales in comparison to, to China. So if they have non-performing loans, which they're having, the shadow banking on short duration money can't fund itself, which is starting to happen, um, we can have a very serious problem very quickly in, in China. Gordon, what I love about your two slides there of the Chinese um, debt and, um, and the distortions in their economy is it, it shows that their economy is reaching um, extremes of distortions in a different in different areas than ours, but Precisely. both economies are in extremes. Exactly, distorted for different reasons. But it's important that we understand that you can't have imbalances to this large a degree without problems. They have to be adjusted, and it's very difficult to adjust it. And I think bigger for China with 1.3 billion people. Right, and. Uh, one of the things we can start with uh, in discussing China's uh, having picked all of its low-hanging fruit is one is is the um, the pace of rapid growth is is not mathematically extensible to um, in a linear fashion. In other words, trees don't grow to the sky. And so, when China started its uh, growth in like 1982, its economy was very small, and so a 10 percent um, expansion of its economy was uh, some minor amount of money you know 20 30 billion dollars and and so it, it was able to have this rapid expansion which we've seen in in Japan in the in the 1960s and in Korea in the 1970s it's it's a it's a standard um pattern of of high growth economies that when the economies are small you can get this rapid growth 8 9 10% a year but now that China's uh, purchasing power parity measure of GDP is, is uh, 13 trillion, you know, 10% of 13 trillion is 1.3 uh, trillion, which is basically the size of, of the Spanish or, or Canadian economy. And so, in other words, you can't grow that fast once you've gotten a large economy. And so that's one limit on the low hanging fruit. And remembering that when we talk about growth, the GDP is the addition of consumption, investment, government, and then the net of the export-import. So in their case, the GDP, the big number, as we saw, is is in the investment, right? Whereas the big number in equation for us has been consumption. And when they have to adjust by that magnitude of GDP growth, where do they get that level of investment? They can't. That's an excellent point, Gordon. And uh, we can look at uh, that China's... Um, growth of their uh physical uh economy you know the the um 
the built out environment that they've created here. They've, they've built, you know, uh, millions of housing units. They've built entire subways and, in, in ever in not just the first tier cities like Shanghai and Beijing, but the second and third tier cities also now have subways. There's, um, they've, they've poured much of their fixed investment into infrastructure, which is the right thing to do. But then it reaches the point of total malinvestment. And that's what we have where, they have built out, they've got literally ghost cities that uh, are questionable whether they'll ever be filled or at what rate. The investment, the capital investment has, I believe, it's extorted malinvestment and mispricing to such a degree uh, that it's dramatic. And we're, and, and right down to the residential housing where the people will see it because it's their primary savings uh, vehicle. Right. And we've um, discussed that before, that as you pointed out, um, the average household in China uh, is um, scared of the stock market for good reason, because they know it's rigged. And so um, they don't really have a lot of other options other than their uh, their apartments, their flats, their housing. Sorry, Charles, I didn't mean to. I, I was busting up laughing when you said that because they, they don't trust the stock market because it's rigged. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm watching what's going on all week here with high frequency trading, right. and, and listening to Lewis on CNBC said to them, "Are you under the mistaken belief that people actually believe the market's not rigged?" And he was talking about America. So the commonality is that people don't. In China, they do not trust the markets. And so the only thing they trust is real estate. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, we should, we should be uh, following in their lead. But, um, so this, uh, the, the, the middle class in China owns a second, uh, uh, a second house uh, or a, a third flat, uh, you know, and so that's how they, they pile up their savings is they go buy an empty apartment. But the problem there is um, that the the incomes in China are actually quite low still. And, uh, you know, we we have a lot of young friends in China, so we know that the statistics are, in fact, correct, uh, that a college graduate might make three or four hundred dollars starting out and might work their way up to seven or eight hundred and make, you know, six to eight to ten thousand dollars a year is an extremely good income in China. But the um, the apartments are are a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, and up. It's it's a complete mismatch between incomes and the valuation of their housing. We've got so much capital. We're back to this investment pouring in to build them. You have an attitude and a set of assumptions that the only thing I can save with my money. Um, is in housing. And one of the reasons for that, to make the imbalance work, we have financial repression going on in China and have had for many years, uh, Charles. And that is that they have negative lo- real uh, interest rates. Um, I know that their interest rates are higher, but their inflation is higher. And so these negative real interest rates have been the incentive for them, the average person in China with very little money, to get into housing. And, and, or, and when we talk about housing, we're not talking McMansions. We're talking about basic apartment flats where multiple families even share a floor, a, a floor, but that they have some level of ownership. But it's forced this complete misallocation of capital. And I have a chart up here from UBS that really mapped it out to show the degree, um, to which it's, it's happened. And now it's starting to burst. I have a chart up here that I just saw yesterday. The top chart showing how dramatically residential housing has grown in China, but also on the bottom here, uh, quarter over quarter, how down 40% year over year. So you, you know, go up exponential and fall off like this, and it's such a significant amount of the savings in China. This this makes 2007 look like a minor adjustment if this if this is sustained. Right, and. Um... One of the slides that you have here uh, refers to an article that um, says that Chinese uh, college graduates, only 28 to 30 to 40 percent of them are getting jobs. Uh, in other words, they're, they're graduating 7 million people a year, but only a third of those people are actually getting a job. So you have to wonder, uh, how can you sustain a housing market? When only a third of your college graduates are employed and the, the 20 to 30 million, um, migrants from, um, very poor rural areas are, are moving to the cities and they're making a few thousand dollars a year, not even seven or eight thousand. It's impossible for them to own real estate at the, at the valuations. And, um, what's also interesting is, um, that 
the Chinese assumption, the general assumption is the government will never let housing go down. Now, does that remind you of 2007? It certainly does. Exactly. I saw some articles where the people in China were just screaming about this because uh, they just have so much, I won't use the word confidence, but belief that the government is there to protect them. And this is wrong. And their investment in housing should not go down. And these are really poor assumptions, major flaws in assumptions, and something sustaining assumptions. That's right. And one of the uh, sustaining assumptions that you um, have here is, in, for the Chinese, is the expectations of future prosperity are so sky high. And we understand why. If you've been in an economy that's been growing at 7 or 8% a year for decades, then, you know, these young people think that they, um, that they expect to have the same expansion of prosperity forever. But, um, as, as we can see from our slides, that is not possible. Trees do not grow to the sky and, um, housing is already out of reach. Two thirds of the college graduates can't get jobs. There's going to be a huge attitude adjustment and that's what causes social unrest. China and the U.S. have picked all their low-hanging fruit. Both are stagnating and, and relying on um, unsustainable credit bubbles uh, based on financialization. And the system's been gamed by shadow banking. And it's just a really shaky foundation for future prosperity. Well, isn't that exactly what we've done? And there's the parallels uh, again, that we went to shadow banking to be able to sustain um, credit creation. Because without the credit creation, uh, which was taking the place of, of, you know, the capitalist system is based on the fact that it's about savings. And we take that savings, the money profits, and we put it back and we have investments. And so investments create the savings. And there's a balance between the other elements of it in consumption. But when you start to consume more than you produce, you end up with a problem. And, and so... The, the the what's happened here with the with the shadow banking system is we start to we start to jury jury rig that that little equation and um, and then suddenly things get completely distorted and the magnitude of the shadow banking system in the United States which really funded our housing bubble problem with securitization is has done and is doing the same thing in in um, in China. And that shadow banking system has allowed this massive, we were talking about residential, but it's commercial real estate, um, it's infrastructure, but it's all the application of capital um, investment that came in was highly leveraged. And then they, when they when it started to slow, and it has been slowing for quite some time, not only exports have been slowing, but the capital investment uh, inflows have also been slowing. You have to figure out a way of sustaining it, and we're back to shadow banking. And in China's case, Charles, you're well familiar. They've been using th all the commodities, stockpiling copper, your uh, steel, um, all, all aluminum, etc., and all of these hard assets. They were then using as collateral to leverage up loans, and um, and so the most heavily lever leveraged people in in China right now are the corporations at, at, with very, very high debt that costs them a lot, which is very expensive. So any kind of slowing, that's called a margin call. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's what's going, beginning to happen in China. That was what was happening and to some degree is, is happening here in the United States. And so it forces this more printing. But when you start to print more money, it just buys you more time, but you quickly run out of runway. And then you end up with you just can't, isn't sustainable. This chart here in China on the right is is showing the, the what what dollar they're getting for GDP for the rate of credit growth and the same as ours ours has went negative um, theirs is falling down towards being negative where money no longer creates real growth because there's just too much debt overhang that's consuming there's not enough real wealth that's being created credit is not wealth that's a superb summary of the situation uh, Gordon, in both the U.S. and China, and that these distortions will have to be adjusted. And um, unfortunately, the leadership in both countries has no plan B. Uh, not that I can see. And to be fair, when the distortions are this great, the social fabric of the adjustment is, is, is politically unacceptable. Nobody is going to be able to carry the day. It always ends up being a, a crisis. I think you've um, ended it on just the right point that uh, crisis is inevitable. 
and we just we cannot predict and, and no one can predict the exact uh, procession of that crisis but there will be a crisis that will be settled in in, in one way or another and uh, our only choice is how we react in that crisis precisely and the kind of leadership that will step forward his is not very kind of the type of leadership that comes out of these crises typically it's hard-fisted dominant people who feel very strongly about a subject and, and often are right in general of what needs to be done, but uh, but not necessarily the right leadership overall. And you can get some very bad leadership during a crisis that may solve the problem, uh, sort of, but it creates other big problems. And we, we can talk about uh, numbers of leaders who put names beside that, that one. Charles, we have to run. We're way past our hard line here, but a great discussion. Could you tell our listeners where they could uh, learn more about your writings? Please visit me at of two minds.com. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Talk to you again next month. Okay. Bye. This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com, and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business.